Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. Oh, I am happy to be with you. Um, it's been, <laughs> it's been crazy. You, you know, I always tell you the craziness that's been going on. I mean, in terms of just being busy and mostly it's been really good. There have been some technical issues and I've shared some things with you. And then last week at the, on the episode, I shared that the, interview that I was supposed to do the prior weekend had had some craziness in terms of a comedy of errors of getting that scheduled. Well, we did finally have that interview. It was lovely. It's the interview I'm bringing you today. I'm very excited to share it with you. But (laughs) because it's me and my comedy of errors life, I I don't know, probably uh, when you talk about migraines, you shouldn't talk about comedy, right? But um, comedy of errors, at any rate, I've had a migraine for... This is day seven, eight. It's actually finally calmed down to a dull roar today. But I've had a migraine off and on for the last week, at least. And so I was trying to get this episode up and published. And this migraine has just been kicking my rear end, along with, you know, some other things that have been keeping me busy. Well, last week on Thursday, I think, I finally, finally had some space the migraine was manageable. I didn't feel like I was going to throw up. I could do the I could I could upload the episode. Literally, I was going to sit down, I was finishing something up at the office, and then I was gonna sit down and do this episode, and the power went out in our office. Yeah. Not just a short little power outage, you know, like it flickered off and it flickered back on. Nope, nope, this took a while to get resolved. And I just, I just laughed because what can you do besides laugh? So my apologies to Kirsty, who is my guest today, for getting this up so much later than I promised her. And my apologies to you, of course, for being late with this episode. Uh, but I am excited to have Kirsty Lore as my guest today. And we are here to talk about her book, A Short History of Queer Women. It is exactly what the title says it is. It is uh, an informative, but short, as it says, eh, brief um, history of queer women throughout recorded history and what we can find of them. You know I love history, so I loved learning more about women that I maybe did not know as much about. Kirsty's writing is hilarious sometimes. It is informative, but it is so accessible. You are going to find people that you connect with in this story. You are going to learn facts, not storybook. You're going to learn facts that you didn't know about women throughout history that maybe you didn't know before. And I just really think her writing is approachable. She's hilarious. There are... uh, I My husband kept saying, what's funny now? And I'd be like... (laughs) Well, I'd have to go back and redo this whole chapter to make this one line be as funny as it is in context. And he'd be like, yeah, never mind. Just keep reading. (laughs) So don't maybe read it in a public place if you are prone to laughing out loud like I am. Um, Unless you like having strangers look at you funny. That could be, that could be, or it could be a way to meet people and tell them what you're reading about. But I really, really enjoyed it. Let me go ahead and give you the description of this book. Uh... It starts with saying, no, they weren't just friends. Queer women have been written out of history since, well, forever. But historians famously care about women, said no one. From Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, who sailed the seas together disguised as pirates, to U.S. football captain Megan Rapahoe, 
Rapino, excuse me, declaring you can't win a championship without gays on your team via countless literary salons and tuxedos. A short history of queer women sets the record straight on women who have loved other women throughout the ages. Who says lesbians can't be funny? I didn't know lesbians weren't supposed to be funny, but um, the one who wrote this book is hilarious. And if just in that brief paragraph, you got a glimpse of some of the just fabulous one-liners maybe or but just the really fun accessible way that Kirsty writes about this topic that will hopefully be engaging and get people to read it i have to tell you my american is showing because when it says u.s football captain <laughs> i had to stop and be like football yes it is football i know we call it soccer in the u.s but nowhere else do they call it soccer it's football everywhere else but my american brain was like football foot soccer yes but no, it's it's just, it is football everywhere else. We are the only ones who call it soccer. So that statement is correct. I'm going to stop blathering because I feel like I'm rambling on and it is much more fun for you to listen to Kirsty talk about this fabulous book. So again, the book is called A Short History of Queer Woman. The author is Kirsty Lohr. Hi, Kirsty. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. It is wonderful to have you here, and I'm excited to talk about your book, A Short History of Queer Women. But before we get to the book, if you wouldn't mind just um, starting by sharing a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Yeah, so um, my name is Kirsty Law. I'm English. I live in Brighton in the UK, and I work full-time as an English teacher. So I teach language um English as a language to non-native speakers, but I also write and I recently had the book A Short History of Queer Women published um, in October last year. So yeah, I kind of juggled two jobs, teaching English and writing, um, and I'm really enjoying it, yeah. Wonderful. Well, teaching English is a really good basis for writing. So uh, do you ever find yourself thinking in terms of how you teach when when you're writing? Yeah, definitely. I think it really helped my writing because I've always been a writer as such since I was a child. It's been something that I've always really enjoyed and always wanted to do. And there was always that dream in the back of my head of one day I'll I'll be published or one day I want to just to write. Then I fell into teaching English and um, it really, really did help improve my writing, not only grammatically, um, in terms of structure and things like that, but also it introduced me to a lot of things. So when I studied creative writing for my master's, it introduced me to a lot of feminist texts and a lot of feminist writers and a lot of different writers that maybe I wouldn't have been introduced to otherwise. And that really shapes the way that I write and the kind of things that would influence my writing. So yeah, it's definitely taken me on on a journey in terms of writing and things like that. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Can you give um, an overview of a short history of queer women? Yeah, I'd love to. So it's a short read, very short read, and it details the uh, chronological timeline of queer women throughout history, mostly centred on the Western world, but with um, examples from other parts of the world and cultures and societies and identities. It's historical but I would say creative non-fiction because, of course, there are parts of history that we don't know what happened. Uh, so I guess I kind of looked at other historians and their work and decided that a lot of them filled in the gaps, so to speak, with their own objective views. And I just thought, why don't I do that? I'll do that too. And so I did. So, yeah, it's just a short read. It's quite informal. Um, it's in by no means an academic text. It's quite funny. It's full of humor. But also there's a very serious and dark and depressing themes centrally throughout, as with queer history, there usually tends to be. Right. Yes, because it's not, it's not uncomplicated in terms of its relationship with the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, so... As a history major, I can say that history books tend to oftentimes be a little dry. Yours is not. Can you talk about the writing style and why you opted for humor and a little bit of tongue in cheek? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I love history. I've always loved history since I was a kid. And it was actually something I was 
probably going to pursue, but it was the, as you said, the, the dry nature of the, of the text that put me off, but also it's very male dominated. Um, obviously it's a lot better now, but with past historical texts, they tend to be very male dominated. And as I said, objective and, um, heteronormative as well. So what, because I love history and I've always loved history. I wanted to put a different spin on it. And the same goes with queer theory, gender studies, lesbian studies. These are all things that I am interested in. But as you said, the texts can sometimes be a bit inaccessible, a bit dry. Um, the jargon can be kind of overcomplicated. It puts a lot of people off this t- these types of texts. So that was one of the main reasons, actually, for why I wrote this book, was that it was accessible to those kind of people that do love history and they love queer theory. Um, but they just maybe feel uncomfortable reading those kind of texts because maybe it's a bit inaccessible or the language is quite tricky. So that was, yeah, that was the main reason why I wrote it in such a tongue in cheek manner, uh, informal, you know, there's, there's a bit of swearing in there and I just wanted it overall to be an easy, an easy accessible read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it definitely is that. So in terms of your, your research, how difficult was it to find the source material? Because as you mentioned, you know, often books or history is written from the dominant powers. It's more patriarchal. It's more heteronormative. And oftentimes you mentioned a couple of times that there was a lot of, a lot of source material that got destroyed because of the nature of relationships that you're talking about. So how difficult was it to find source material? Yeah, really difficult. Um, I think for, for a person who maybe didn't, who, who just started in this queer world of looking for his, historical queer people, it would have been extremely difficult. But because I've been searching for these people since I was a child, I, because I, 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 came, I realized that I was a lesbian when I was 15 and, um, I immediately set out looking for people that were like me. And it was tr- very, very, very tricky, very difficult that it, it didn't exist really. Um, I'm part of, kind of the last generation that didn't have the internet uh, at school or at home so there was no easy access to to just a click of a button and finding people that were like me so I've been searching for these people since I was 15 so I I knew they existed really I, I just knew I had to find them so that's what I've been doing just finding them using the internet scouring sources queer history is fragments it's not consistent like heterosexual history queer history is usually letters that have been ripped up or burned or just fragments like Sappho's poetry for example um it's it's not um chronological so that was the hard part was trying to put everything in order and just figuring out where where these people were hiding where they were because I always knew they existed it was it's a bit silly isn't it to think that these people never existed it's just happening to find them but hopefully what I wanted to achieve with this book because it's such a small short read it's quite chaotic in terms of introducing lots of different people I was hoping that people would would look through it and decide who they identified with or who they like more. And then it would give them the tools to go and find more information about that particular person. So um, that's the hope, yeah, of, of, of making it less difficult for other people. Sure. And that's kind of where the, um, you mentioned creative nonfiction. So kind of filling in those blanks, creating yeah. some conversations, those sorts of things. Speaking of conversations, we are going to pick this conversation up after our first break for this episode. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back with a conversation about names. Stay tuned. Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Now 
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Kirsty Lohr about her book, A Short History of Queer Women. Let's return to that interview. And and one part, you, you said something about um, there were a lot of women in your book named Barbara, and you were wondering if there was a connection. There was a chapter that was just cracking me up because it was... Um, it was the one about Virginia Woolf and it was like Virginia and Vivian and v- there was like six V names and I was so confused after a while about which V woman you were talking about. I don't yeah, have a question. Definitely. It just made me laugh. <laughs> yeah. The, and the name Anne as well, that pops up quite a lot. Yes. Um, so what was your process then for deciding which stories to include? Yeah, a lot of people have asked me this question. Um, I really, really, really wanted to be as representative as possible. So, I mean, the last thing you want to do is write a book about inclusivity and then exclude certain people. So that was always in the back of my mind in that, especially lesbians of colour, black lesbians. Um, as I said, it's mostly Western culture because I do feel that sometimes there might be a line where I can't cross in terms of kind of uh putting my assumptions on gender and 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 whatnot on other cultures uh that's something that is quite tricky to navigate so i'd rather try to avoid that but still try to give the the space for it to be there so for example there are things from asia that i've included but yeah that's quite it's quite tricky to navigate that but in terms of the uk and and the states and and the western world Things like Harlem was something that I really wanted to include because the Harlem scene, of course, is is famous for its literary, the literary people involved and the music and the creativity that came out of it. But the queer black element of it is often ignored. And there was a lot of queer people, both men and women, uh, trans, lesbian, gay, LGBTQ involved in that. So that was something that I particularly wanted to highlight, but also as is with feminists and feminist texts, it's a lot of white middle-class women um, because usually they were literate and they, they had the tools to write. So a lot of working class black women or people of colour were unable to express themselves and their queerness. So I, I made a point of really trying to find things like that. And there is a part of two women during the uh, civil war in the United States, two black women. So, that was something that I really, really wanted to include and just show that that queer women is not just white. It's not white centric. It's not middle class. It just happens to appear that way because obviously people with money and people that are literate are going to have the loudest voices. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was really impressed with the conversation between the two, the two black women during the Civil War era, because there's so many strikes against that history being preserved. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it's, it's still something that people battle with today, isn't it? It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's just the, the history of what people want to tell because it suits their agenda and the history of what people don't want to express, which is sad because a lot of people would be able to see themselves in that history and, and maybe they would be able to come to terms with themselves a lot easier if they had that available to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In terms of intersectionality, the more, you know, the, the more marginalized the person is, or, you know, if you have multiple minorities in your personality and your identity, the harder it is sometimes, I think, to be recognized within broader histories. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, things are definitely getting better, but I mean, there's still a long way to go in, in, in the academic sense of history, mm-hmm. as you, as you know, as a history major. So, um, hopefully though, that this, this is, it's a long journey, but hopefully it will change. Yeah. What do you hope readers might take away from the book? Well, like I said earlier, I, I hope it gives them the tools to go find more about these people because there's certain people that I'm attracted to in this book that, like, for example, Virginia Woolf. I'm, I'm a big fan of Virginia Woolf. And she is someone that I have continued to explore and educate myself and read about um through her diaries and things like that and i know that i'm not the only one to get quite obsessed with people from history so i would hope that someone who reads this book might pick someone from there maybe i don't know lorraine hansbury for example and just 
delve further into her life because she's such an amazing writer and um, did a lot of amazing things. So it would be cool to introduce these people that have remained hidden and for people to go and just find more information about them and then tell their friends and, and, and just things like that. So that's that's the biggest hope, really, in that people will explore and share. So, yeah, that's that's the main hope. Yeah. And can you um, can you talk a little bit about deciding uh, the use of the word queer in the title? I, I know that a lot of the women that you discuss wouldn't necessarily have defined themselves in the way that we might recognize today simply because vocabulary was different. So for you and you talk a little bit about this toward the beginning of the book, but for you, um, what does that word queer encompass in terms of the, your book? Yeah, that's a good question. So this was actually probably the most difficult part of writing the book was how to refer to the to people of the past um pronouns especially it's uh ever changing the community at the moment with it's it's just changing so fast it's quite difficult to keep up um now when when we talk about asserting identities on on people of the past it's extremely difficult because on the one hand you don't want to to give someone an identity that they might not necessarily identify as but then also you you don't want to contribute to erasure so it's it's very difficult to to decide what to do so um i think what i eventually did was if there was a lot of evidence there to suggest otherwise we would use the pronoun that they were given um for their birth sex and it's something that i'm not entirely comfortable with still because of course a lot of these women uh they would have been trans they probably would have been trans men so they if they were around now they would have identified as a trans man or even non-binary so again yeah it's just it's something that people of the community are still figuring out really how to address people of the past and then you also have butch lesbians who could be erased in that maybe this person was a trans man maybe they they would have been a butch lesbian we just we just don't know so the word queer, I remember when I first learned this word queer as a academic word rather than a slur, because obviously the word was a slur for a very, very long time. It's kind of been reclaimed by the queer community and that it encompasses all sorts of uh, people who challenge heteronormativity. And that that's what the word encompasses. So it can include all parts of the LGBTQ community. And it gives you that kind of relief to to use it in a way where we maybe don't know the identity of certain people but we know that they did challenge heteronormativity and maybe they were a member of the lgbt community but we don't necessarily know so the word queer is a gift really it's it's such a gift to the community in that we can use it so freely and it's yeah it's just as i say it's it's a gift really that word it's it's such a great word to use Mm-hmm. Because there's, as as you can see from the LGBT, which used to just be LGBTQ, and has it, more letters keep being added. There's so many more identities and ways of perceiving identity than people might realize. Yeah, massively. Yeah. Um, it's it's great. I mean, there's like there's, there's there's two views to it, isn't it? It's like it's sad that we can't all just be who we want to be without having to constantly add these letters and these acronyms to the LGBTQ community. But it's so necessary that we have to because you get people that get angry with us adding more and more things, but it's like without that, there'd be no visibility and these people wouldn't exist. So it's 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 necessary to do that, you know, and hopefully one day we will get to a place where we don't need to do that and everybody can be who they want to be and they don't have to they don't have to give themselves these words just so they can remain visible. But I mean, I don't see that coming in, in the short term future. And who knows where it'll be in the, in the long term future. But w- without those identities, people remain invisible and then they don't exist. And that's just honestly, as a person who does identify as lesbian and, and I've had that throughout my life, it's, it's not a nice way to live. So yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's it's interesting because, as you say, hopefully in the future, we won't necessarily need to have this whole list of of an acronym. Um, but it 
But in terms of identity and just issues surrounding this community, it, it, it shouldn't surprise me. And yet it still does that people think it's a new issue and they're like, well, this, these things didn't exist in my day. And there's, I think your book and other books like it are so important to show that people weren't just friends. You know, they were, there's, there's so much more to the depth of those relationships than we give them credit for. Yeah, that makes me laugh when people say that when they're, they're, you know, they, they get angry. Like it's a, like the world is changing and, and, the, and it's a new thing. And, it, and a lot of people go, Oh, why can't we just go back to how it was? And it's like, there never was a time where it was like that. It's just people were ignorant and chose not to, well, yeah, historians chose not to express that. And, and a lot of people were remained hidden and invisible. So we've always been there. If you look back to Sappho, for example, she wrote about women and wrote about loving women a lot. She invented the guitar pick so she could keep her nails short. You know, she did, she did a lot of things with, with a lot of evidence to show that she was into other women. So these people have always existed. It's just now with technology and social media, people have, ha- are able to use their voice and get it across to people without being censored. So, that's just the way the world has has worked and people yeah people get upset because they they genuinely think it's just a new thing the only new thing really is terminology and you know people don't like change do they they don't like changing their ways so this right. the term, the terminology and vocabulary usually if someone doesn't understand something a a, re- a reaction is to just go against it isn't it it's just to it's to fight it well, instead of embracing something that actually is nice and can help the world work in a better way. So um, it's just unnecessary, a lot of this hatred. It's just, it, a lot of it is just so unnecessary. It, yes, I agree. And it's just really just comes down to fear, fear of change, yeah. fear of leaving that comfort zone. I admit this is not the cheeriest of places to take a break but we are going to take the second break of this episode we are going to pick this conversation up when we come back from the break so stay tuned you're listening to the gsmc book review podcast and i'll be right back tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts now listen close and hear this out there's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching the golden state media concepts podcast network is here Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with Kirsty Lohr. We're talking about her book, A Short History of Queer Women. Let's return to the interview. Really just comes down to fear, fear of change, yeah. fear of leaving that comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, look, at it's horrific what's happening at the moment with trans people. It's absolutely horrific. And yeah. that is just a fear of change. And trans people have been here since the beginning of time. It's not, it's not a new thing. But if you look at the LGBT community, as a whole, if you see in the in the fifties and sixties, gay men were often attacked because that was the that was the new thing at the time, even though it wasn't new. But that's people were being seen then, and then throughout the AIDS crisis, and then lesbians, and then bisexuals, and now it's for the it's it's trans people. Now it's their turn to receive hatred because trans people are finally speaking up for themselves. So it's not as if they're just appeared out of nowhere. They've been here forever. They're just now in terms, because they have this social media, they have accessibility, schools, education are doing well and and giving these people a voice. So they're feeling more and more comfortable. So 
when people say that they've not been here forever, it makes me laugh because actually it's a sign of, of people being actually comfortable with themselves and, and the world changing and allowing these voices to be heard. That's why we hear, that's why we hear them now because of that. It's not, it's not just something they've not just popped up out of nowhere. So it is horrific what is going on with that at the moment. And it is really life or death for a lot of these people. So yeah, it infuriates me really that this is still a thing that is happening today. And it's it's just sad. It's really, really sad actually at the moment in the community. It is sad. And it's it's two sides of the same coin where it gives me hope that we are becoming more inclusive. But on that, the flip side, it's like every time we somehow get a little more inclusivity for certain groups, then we have to figure out some other group to hate. And I just it it baffles me that there has to always be some things supposedly scary yeah and it well it's the oppressor is always going to have some sort of oppressive well i mean with the trans community at the moment what what's happening is that the let's say the patriarchy or the or just a heteronormative society obviously trans doesn't fit into that so um, a lot of it is trying to pit the community against each other. So we have this minor, um, I want to alliterate, very minor part of lesbians where they are against trans people. And unfortunately, that has become the main issue in these turfs, uh, has become the main source. So and this has been put by society in that what they're trying to sell the rest of the world is that, oh, even the community are against trans people when it's absolute rubbish because... It's, we're very, the, the community is, is very, um, together and solidarity and it's a very minor part of the lesbian community that are against trans people. And what's unfortunate is that the media and society has picked up on that. And then mm. you obviously get people like JK Rowling who just spouts nonsense with issues that don't concern her. And yeah, what, what it does, it ends up pitting the, the community against each other rather than fighting the oppressor. So, I mean, that's just that those tactics have worked throughout history though. You know, once, once you get a community that doesn't fit into a certain societal organization, you have to get in into that community and then start pitting them against each other. Don't you? So unfortunately that's what's happening at the moment. But um, yeah, as I say, it's only, a, it's, it's a minor part of lesbians that are against trans people. And, and hopefully these people, these these turfs will just hopefully fizzle out. Mm-hmm. That's the flip side of visibility, though, especially in this yeah. day and age with social media. Is it, you, with the internet, with social media, people have the ability to find people that look and sound like them, but then that also has the ability to amplify those minor voices to make them seem more numerous or important than they might actually be. I know, I know. Like I. Because, like I said before, I've, um, I was kind of that last generation that was, didn't really, I didn't grow up with social media. And for that, I'm eternally grateful in that. I mean, I, I mean, I did struggle with my sexuality quite a lot when I was a kid. So it would have been beneficial to just click uh, a website or whatever and find someone in another country or, or someone that was like me. That would have been wonderful. But then, as you say, you have that flip side where it's, um, horrific, isn't it? The, the bullying nature that goes on on social media and that, and yeah, everyone, everyone is given a voice and yeah, we have freedom of speech, but then, you know, freedom of speech doesn't necessarily mean hate speech. They're completely two different things. And I think that's what gets confused a lot is when we use this term freedom of speech, it doesn't necessarily mean that we can just spout hatred. Um, yeah. So that is the flip side of, of, of things like Twitter and Instagram. And um, I'm, yeah, I'm quite glad that I wasn't in school for that because it doesn't sound fun. Mm, yeah. Yes. And the fact that our awkward high school years are not recorded for all history on the internet. <laughs> I know. Can you imagine? <laughs> uh, so is this topic, uh, this book a one-off or do you think that you would write um, other short histories of this nature? I, yeah, when I was writing it, I did think that actually would, would that be something that I would do? Because as I said, terminology and, and queer theory and history is regularly updated. It changes quite, quite frequently. It's very fluid. But actually, I don't know. I think, um, I'm actually working on another book at the moment, which is slightly different. So, um, history is something that I, that I love. 
and I'll probably end up going back to it at some point. But I feel like with queer women and lesbians in particular, that that's really what I'm qualified or kind of allowed to write about because I am a lesbian and and I have some background in in history and English and things like that. I felt I feel like if I started writing short histories of anything else, I wouldn't really have the qualifications to do that. So, but I'll probably go back to history in some sort of way. Are there any other writings that you would like to highlight at this point? What is in my own or other? People? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, that you've that you've written. That I've written. Well, um, I'm currently writing about um, IVF because me and my ex-wife, we uh, went through IVF to have our little boy. Um, the whole process was strange, uh, expensive, £13,000 altogether. Um, there wasn't any information out there that we could... When we start, When we had this idea of having a child, we actually didn't know how we would have one. We knew that same-sex couples could have one, but we didn't really know how. So we did what most lesbians do in these situations, is just ask our exes. So we, we asked our exes who have kids. Um, and that's really how a lot of queer people go about it, when they want to have children or they want to do things like that. We, they usually ask someone in the community that's done it before because there's no information out there. So um, what I'm going to write about is that whole process, really. and And because... I find humor in a lot of things that really aren't humorous, but I think sometimes it can lighten the tone, but there was a lot of um, comments and just, I think the, the whole process really neat. It's quite archaic, probably all over the world. It's very heteronormative having children. So there's a lot of questions that you get that make zero sense, but also uh, are really offensive. So I think, I'm, I'm just going to highlight that and write about that. Like one particular doctor asked if our son was going to have a male role model. And I just thought it was like, you, you, they would never ask that to a heterosexual couple. And also the cost, you know, a heterosexual couple can just go and have a child without anyone interfering. Whereas it cost us 13,000 pounds just to have our little boy. And we were extremely lucky because it worked the first time. And yeah, so the main reason is just to provide that information for queer couples. And if they want to have children and then, they will know how because that's basically as simple as it sounds they don't know how to have a child if they want one which is absurd and then again just to highlight how archaic and ridiculous the whole system is and just how it needs to be updated and people need to be retrained and and yeah just just things like that sounds important and very informative but you know important for people to have access to that information yeah exactly that was i mean it was something that I never thought I'd ever write about. But once we went into that process and I was thinking, there's just no information here about this. Like we, we want a child and we know we'd give this child a very good life, but we actually have no idea how to have this child, which is funny in a way, because if you think of a, of a straight couple, I mean, you almost immediately learn how to have children. It's, it's part of life. It's fact. Uh, but at school, you're not taught about queer families. I mean, I think hopefully that is a bit different now in that, especially where I live. I live in Brighton in the UK, which is very, very, very liberal, very gay friendly. Um, but you know, I, I have family in the States. Um, we, you can see what's going on in Florida at the moment. Um, things in a lot of different states. So you know full well that queer families and access to that is not being talked about in some of these schools. So a book to help people figure out how to form a family, I think would be incredibly useful. Yes, I agree. Jumping in here, time for our last break of this episode. When we come back, Christy will be talking about her journey to decide to become a published author. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Golden State Media Concepts Social Media Podcast. Time to hashtag everything. We talk about all the fun, crazy stories on social media. From Instagram to Facebook, Twitter to Tumblr, or probably even Friendster. Join us each week as we explore the quirky side of social media. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Social Media Podcast. It's simple, it's simple, such a sad song. The one that
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Kirsty Lore. You mentioned earlier that you've always written, um, so you, you, you've always enjoyed it. You knew that you wanted to write. So what then prompted you to decide to write for publication? I think it's just always been a dream of mine. I've, um, I'm kind of one of those people that I, if I, if I want to do something, I will do it to prove to myself that I can do it. And then, you know, once I've done that, and then I'll, I'll, I'll want to do something else. It's quite a bad trait, actually. Um, it's not healthy, <laughs> but, um, I think as a child, I, I've always been a big, big reader, big reader. And I'm an only child as well. So I've spent, I spent quite a lot of time on my own and my own imagination. So being a writer is this lifestyle that I thought, sort of envisioned in that I'd be someone like Virginia Woolf, just like living in a, in a room in the back of the end of a garden, just writing. But obviously that isn't self-sufficient. So that never happened. But, um, yeah, writing the publication was just a dream. So I was really old school about it as well. I just wrote it and then just emailed it to loads of people, just expecting them to read it, which was so naive. But thankfully one person did read it and was a really big champion of it. And I'm so lucky that that happened because it's kind of unheard of, really. A lot of people have literary agents or self-publish, which was a route I did think about going down. But yeah, I just got so lucky. And sometimes I still can't believe it really that, um, it happened. But yeah, my publishers are great. They're good. They're good champions and they're, um, good allies too. So out of your experience then of kind of, muddling your way through in some ways do you have advice for um aspiring authors yes yeah, it's, it's funny that because i i still don't really see myself as an author it's a, a bit of imposter syndrome but i think if you want something and you believe in it then you go for it and no matter how i think especially when you write about the community or you write from a queer point of view you're kind of used to being told no or you're used to being told that your stories are important so you just tend to kind of go with that attitude, but I didn't, and I thought that my story was important, and maybe there's a form of arrogance to that, or maybe there's um maybe some kind of there's a, a bit of a negativity for that, but I don't know. I just think uh, I thought you, yeah, if a woman you tend it tends to happen if a woman is is aggressive, I'm putting that in air quotes, that they're, they're called arrogant when actually. If it was a man in that situation, which men tend to do is just shove their work in everyone's faces and expect it to get published. I kind of just went with that mentality and just thought, yeah, like I, I wrote this. I believe in it. I think it's important and I think people should read it. So I channeled a white straight man and yeah, it worked in the end. So that's my advice. Channel white straight men. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> When you take the time to read for yourself rather than reading for research or something of that nature, who are your favorite genres and authors? Yeah, so I love, I really love reading. Um, it's the only thing that calms me down really, especially with a toddler that I've got at the moment. So, um, I, I kind of read a lot of different genres. I, I used to only read, um, classics like literature classics that was only really what I used to read and then um thankfully I evolved because I was missing out on a lot of good books um if I want an easy read I'm really into there's a lot of um like sapphic rom-coms at the moment which is just basically rom-coms but with lesbians and it's not the best writing in the world it's not the it's not Virginia Woolf it's not Dickens but it's just nice to to read a story to escape and, but also to see yourself in these characters. So I've been reading a lot of that at the moment. Um, but then, yeah, I'll read all sorts of things. I mean, at the moment I'm reading The Alchemist, which I've been um, dying to read for ages. I usually tend to stick to just female authors though, or, or queer authors, because I just feel like they don't get as much airtime as, as others, but it's not something that I would definitely stick to, but it's what I tend to do. I did read a really good book actually recently called Shuggy Bane by Douglas Stewart, which was incredible. And that was, uh, it's about a young boy, um, from Scotland and it, it's just, so it was so, so, so good. Um, but then like, yeah, I read Ruby Fruit Jungle this year for the first time, which I've been meaning to read by Rita Mae Brown. 
I read um, The Recent Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. That was really, really good. That's quite popular at the moment. Um, but then, yeah, I'll read, like, I, I read The Handmaid's, the Handmaid's Tale for the first time again, which is bizarre because I've always meant to read it. So I, it's very varied. I'll, I've, I've thankfully left the era of reading only classic literature. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll read anything that I can get my hands on, really. So, yeah, I just enjoy all sorts. And classic liter- literature is enjoyable and it's important, but I would not classify Virginia Woolf as necessarily lighthearted. So sometimes you just need a little <laughs> something lighthearted. I know. I mean, even, even in some cases, it's not even enjoyable. It's just, <laughs> it's like, what, what, what is this? I just, I just like, I mean, to be fair, actually, with Virginia Woolf, I actually like her as a person more than her writing. Obviously, her writing is incredible. Stream of Consciousness is an amazing narrative technique that she basically invented. But I think I'm more obsessed with her as, a, as an individual rather than her writing. So that actually gets me into reading as well as the authors. So I, I tend to sometimes um more interested in the author than their actual writing like Beta Sackville West is another one she wrote a few books but she's not necessarily the most captivating writer but it was more her as a person that would make me gravitate towards the writing Mhm makes sense In terms of internet presence um do you have a website and where can people find you on social media so I'm just on Instagram, um, Kirsty and then Law, L-O-E-H-R, which is my name. I'm on Twitter, but I don't really tend to use Twitter and it's quite a toxic environment at the moment, Twitter. It seems to be anyway. Um, so I, I, it's not like I avoid it, but I just, I just tend to use Instagram more. So that's where you can find me on Instagram. All right. Thank you. Um, Kirsty, we've talked about a few different things today, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you want to make sure you highlight during this time? Um, yeah, maybe the, um, the use of kind of female sexuality in a way that I've presented quite a lot in the book in that women in general are often painted as sexless, sexless, and especially lesbians in particular, that the lesbians have this reputation in the community as quite placid or, you know, like we make for life, which, (laughs) which, yeah, we do. Um, and there are stereotypes that lesbians have that are 100% true, which is very funny. And that's where the humor comes from. But also lesbians do have sex. Women have sex. And that's something that I have highlighted a lot in the book in that we're very sexual people and uh, lesbians and women in particular shouldn't be painted as these, um, sexless individuals. You know, I think it's important that that we see that that lesbians and women have have been having sex since the beginning of time and that lesbians have been having sex with other women since the beginning of time and it's something that we do and find pleasure in and yeah that's something that i really wanted to highlight in the book all right thank you now there are millions of people grasping their pearls (gasps) what (laughs) (laughs) i love it good (laughs) Well, thank you. Uh, Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to talk to me. No, no, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you once again to Kirsty for not only joining me to talk about this book, but for her inordinate amount of patience in actually getting this episode out into the world to exist. (laughs) Really, really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And thank you to her for writing this book. It is so important for people to have an understanding of history that we don't always see written in the books that we study in school. There's so many different communities that are not always well represented, that are underrepresented in our history books. And so it's important for people to bring those stories out where people can read them, can learn more about them. And as I said at the beginning, I really love Kirstie's writing style. I thought it was hilarious. I laughed so many times, but also just learning some of the stories of women that I maybe knew a little bit about or other women that I'd never heard of, Um, learning more about their lives and their relationships and their loves and the just the way they lived their life to the best of their ability during the time that they could, however they could, um, because it has been it has been a challenge. It has been a very difficult challenge for so many people throughout history as they have tried to navigate 
society when they don't fit into that society. So thank you to Kirsty for writing this book and um, giving a voice uh, or more of a voice, getting the voices that are there out to more people who maybe haven't heard those voices. If you are a fan of history, if you are interested in queer history and uh, in a short, hilarious, but very informative book, then you should definitely check this one out. Or maybe you know someone who loves to read and is interested in all of those things, then you might want to get that reader in your life, this book, or let them know about it. Um, so yes, thank you for coming along on this <laughs> crazy. Well, no, the interview was not crazy. Just the process of getting the interview to you. But thank you for joining me for this episode and this interview. I hope that you will join me next time. I will be talking, um, actually we're sticking to the same subject, except this time it's a memoir rather than history. It is, um, Light Come Out of the Closet by Roger Leslie. It is his memoir of growing up in a Polish Catholic family in the 1970s, realizing he was gay and the memoir of all of that. So join me for that interview for the, on the next episode. Hope you're having a great week. As always, if you are a fan of this podcast, like, follow, subscribe. That way you'll always get new episodes when they come out, regardless of my comedies of errors that may delay uploading. Also, uh, reviews are very, very helpful. So if you would like to leave a review written or starred, it helps me get this podcast out to more listeners, and I'm greatly appreciative of those reviews. And then finally, you can follow the podcast on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. I love hearing from you. So come find the podcast on social media. Let me know what you've been reading. Again, hope you're having a great week. Hope you had a good weekend. But as always, my main hope for you is that whatever you're doing, wherever you are, you have plenty of time to get yourself lost in as many good books as you can read. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www gsmcpodcast.com Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.